Finance Committee to order. Today's date, Wednesday, March 2nd. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today, we have a couple of bills uh, before us, actually four bills. Uh, and we'll be uh, calling upon the, uh, the authors. And I see the first author is here, Senator Johnson. Uh, Senate file 3240, Senator Johnson, welcome. Thank welcome you, Mr. To the committee. Chair. Thank you very much. Well, Senate file 3240 um, should give us some hope in the Ukrainian situation. If Rosa and Warroad can work together in figuring out a solution, there's, there's hope for peace. Please, you know, I didn't mind coming back, but I didn't think I was going to be confronted with that right away. <laughs> you could at least give me, couple, you could give me a couple of days to work on that and we'll have it right here. <laughs> I've been waiting for you to come back just That's so I can bring that yeah, up. I'm sure it was, yeah. No, I appreciate that. Uh, so Senate File 3240 is an appropriation uh, from the all-terrain vehicle account of the natural resources to help improve 13 miles of ATV trails between War Road and Roseau. Uh, it's an exciting opportunity there to expand the, the um, trail system uh, in the hometown of Polaris and, and ATV and up there. And it's uh, really an opportunity for the sportsman's clubs uh, to contribute some of their, their resources and whatnot to, to, to improve that trail system. I have a, uh, several testifiers I'd like to talk about this today. Um, if we could uh, probably start off with Miles uh, today, um, Mr. Chair, and then we've got Ray Bowen from the ATV Association, and then Mayor Fabian uh, is here too as well to lend some support and, and light, uh, highlight this project. Okay, uh, Senator, who did you say your first one was? Miles. Can Miles. you hear me? Miles, okay. Oh, there you are. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Coming through okay. clear. Go ahead, please identify uh, yourself and go ahead. Welcome my name is... My name is Miles Hoganson. Uh, I'm with the Rosal Lake of the Woods Sportsman's Club and the North Star uh, Trail Alliance. I'm a uh, trail administrator for pretty much the county. Uh, what we have here is a uh, uh, abandoned rail bed that the Snowmobile Club purchased. They started the purchase, I think it was in 2009, and we haven't had any funds to be able to develop it. What it what it could be and uh our plan is to uh if we get appropriations we would clean off the top because what happens is when they they took most of the rocks off but there's uh three and four minus rocks out there that puncture tires and things like that and people aren't able to ride like they should and they just don't like riding down it because of that fact so what we would do is we would clean the top off uh level it out clean up some crossings, make it more safe and uh, apply class five gravel down and then some chloride after that. Uh, this here, eventually we'll be able to make a, a safer route to uh, Beltrami State Forest. And that's what we're working on right now. So, so uh, for a point of clarity, um, it starts where and where does it end up? uh you said it ends up in a park i mean where, where's the starting point and the starting miles? point is uh depending on if you're in warroad it starts right on the west side of town if you're in rozo it's on the east side of town okay and it goes all the way to uh all the way there yeah uh before we ask open it up for questions i'll just make a note that we do have a quorum and uh also a note that these bills will be held over for possible inclusion so um questions of the members any questions at all is there um um is there going to be a time when you come along and uh or not come along you decided you want to mute yourself there you go come along with a uh, uh hard packs uh you know asphalt at all or you not any plans for that in the, in the future or you don't have any interest in doing that no we don't really have any interest of that right now okay all right members any questions of the testifier seeing none senator johnson you have another one there i think but um yeah sitting next to you please identify mr. Bowen. yourself mr yeah. bowen <laughs> and welcome welcome uh thank you uh, mr chairman uh, welcome back yeah 
and welcome back to me too. I haven't been here for a couple of years, so as, yeah, you, that's right. as you know with the COVID, my name is Ray Bone. I'm here today representing the All Train Vehicle Association of Minnesota. And I just have a couple of quick comments. One, this is one of our major initiatives for this year, this particular trail. And we are pretty excited about uh, some, doing some trail development in Northwest Minnesota and hope that this is just the start uh, for Northwest Minnesota in terms of the trail development. So uh, with that, I just wanna let you know that we really support this project. Very good. Members, any questions of Mr. Bone? Who's always been here for trails for, for many years. Yes. Good to see you again. Senator, you have somebody quite a bit younger than both of you sitting to your left. Would you introduce him uh, <laughs> as a testifier? Mr. Chair, you, your eyes are starting to get a little <laughs> glazed over, I think. Uh, this is, this is uh, former Representative Dan Fabian. You may recognize him. Uh, welcome, Representative. Welcome, Mayor, to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here. And uh, first, let me start out by saying thanks to Senator Johnson for bringing this bill forward. It really is a, a, a really good bill. I'm thankful to Ray Bowen and at BAM for the support that they have for this. Well, and before, I can't- before you, before you start, please identify yourself. I'm sorry, I'm, my name is Dan Fabian. I'm the mayor of Roseau, Minnesota. So, Thank you, welcome. Okay, greatest town on the face of the earth and uh, the proud <laughs> home of Polaris Industries and a whole bunch of other really good stuff. I'm sorry, have you got your mic on? As far as I know, I do. There yep. you go. Sorry. Right. Yep. So anyway, uh, thanks to Senator Johnson and uh, Advam and Ray Bowen uh, for the work on this. And you saw Miles Hoganson and you heard him testify. Miles is a tireless, tireless worker um, for our riding sports industry up there. He is an amazing guy. He's driving the trail groomers for the snowmobiles. I was up in the Northwest Angle uh, snowmobiling this weekend and he was there. The Edge Riders had their big event and it was very well uh, attended. Had one little minor glitch, I burnt a hole in the piston, but uh, we got a good repair shop up there, so I'll take care of that. Um, and, and, and the riding groups, uh, the riding uh, community up there is, is looking for this uh, trail extension. It's a really, really good trail. I've ridden on it myself um, on the snowmobile, not very much on the ATV, but it's uh, connecting Roseau and Warroad, and as Senator Johnson said, uh, we're working together on this and we certainly hope that it moves forward. It's, uh, it's going to be a great connection, you know, to be able to get out to the Beltrami Island State Forest to move back and forth between Warroad and Stop and Salo and stuff like that. So it's, it's really cool. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any any uh, uh, talk about extensions beyond, uh, beyond the, the rail? Well, there's no talk with specifically to this one here, but we're very interested in expanding our ATV trails up there. I think that uh, it's kind of a hidden jewel to the snowmobile industry and the, uh, with Polaris and Arctic Cat up there. Um, and the trail systems that do exist for uh, snowmobiles is pretty extensive. There's a lot of trails out in the Beltrami uh, State Forest for ATVs, and we've worked on that over the years uh, with the different clubs uh, and down in Grigland, Fortown on Lake of the Woods and Roseau. So it's, it's just another piece of the puzzle. And, uh, you know, the, in the, the interest in the riding sports is growing uh, every year. And uh, we want to be a player in that and a destination for that. Our hotels and cafes and gift shops uh, appreciate the traffic. That's what I was going to ask uh, you if, if, you know, what the numbers are. I know they were down. They were down for a long time, snowmobiles. And uh, obviously with what we've had this last winter, that's got to certainly make a, make a spike in the right direction. Uh, have you seen a lot of, a lot of growth? Uh, were there some years there that you didn't have so much travel up there? Well, there sure is a lot of interest. I don't, I can't address specifically the amount of growth and the number of units and the number of registrations and so forth. But I know that up in my part of the state, there's a tremendous interest in snowmobiling and ATVing. And the other thing is, is people need to understand too, with this trail, as I understand it, we're welcoming anybody to use the trail, you know, for any mode of transportation they have, whether it's a bicycle or walking or whatever. Uh, it's going, it's, this is a, a truly unique trail that we're doing, so. Okay, good. Yep. Good. Members, any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Uh, before I go any further, uh, just for, uh, information we do have a new face with us uh eric spenwin uh, if you want to raise your hand over there he's my new uh, legislative assistant uh replacing will and uh, this is his first day so we're uh, we're expecting him to be able to 
answer all the questions when we get done here. We're going to have a little test after we get done, so we're going to have uh, we're going to have a, we're going to have some fun with that. But uh, welcome to the committee, Senator Howe. Mr. Chair, you have with you before you 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 have Senate File 2930 um, with regards to uh, leaded gasoline contamination assessment appropriation. Uh, something that's been, I, I guess, around for a little bit of time. So uh, go ahead. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, this bill, what this bill would do is a, appropriate a money, uh, some money, and I haven't uh, yet established exactly how much that would be, but it would be uh, to actually let the uh, city of Painesville hire an independent contractor to assess uh, the remediation that is been done at the city of Painesville and also uh, the city of Blaine, the city of Alexandria and the city of Foley. And the reason those four cities are uh, identified out of the about 5,000 plus uh, uh, gasoline leaks that we've had is, is basically uh, we got notified by a news reporter that there was a, there may be some issues and and really what we're trying to do is appease and 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 ensure that the citizens of the state and citizens of these locales that their water's safe there isn't any further issues cuz right now there's a there's there's somewhat of a lack of trust especially in the city of Painesville to uh the what has occurred out there in the remediation process. And uh, this is just as to, it, I think what we're looking to do is try to calm the fears of the, the, that there may be still contamination gone going and that the, that the process was good and have a third party unconnected with MPCA, unconnected with the state to take a look at it just to review the reports that have been done, possibly sample some of the existing wells and to ensure that the process is continuing to go down the right path. And so with that, uh, I've got some additional uh, comments, but I would prefer to go to the testifier, uh, the city administrator of Painesville, and then uh, make further comments after that, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I believe he's present online, is he? I yes. believe he's. I am here, uh, Tarek El Rafai, City Administrator in Painesville. Welcome to the committee. Welcome. Please proceed. And, uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator Howe, for giving me the chance to present. I do have some slides. I don't know if uh, I share my screen or you you put them up on your end. So let me know what you prefer. I think if you want to put them, you should be able to share. Um, Please go ahead. There it is. All right, hold on. I got to do the slides real first. One moment, excuse me. All right, do you see that? We do. All right, um, let's see here. All right. Uh, first of all, this is something that has gone on. Do you, do you see the screen where I have the uh, bill from 2015 up? Yes. All right. Uh, in 2015, there's another bill uh, that aimed to uh, deal with this issue. Um, and as you can see there, uh, there's a company called Terracon that has been providing reports since 1990 on the monitoring of the wells. So this is the bill that was uh, uh, sponsored in 2015. But let me go back and give you some brief background, and then we'll get back to where we are today. Um, I won't go through all these points, but I think it's important to kind of highlight uh, some of them. First of all, uh, there was uh, benzene identified in the former Midtown service station site in Painesville in 1985. Uh, the tanks were removed in 1989. Uh, and then in 1997, so several years later, the benzene was identified in city well number four and later city well number three, which were the primary wells for the um, uh, water in, in the city of Painesville. Uh, there, there were several attempts made at removing uh, this contamination. 
Uh, of course, the contamination was not successful. Uh, well, three and four were discontinued and uh, well, seven and eight were new wells that were brought online to supplement the water loss from closing down those two wells. It's also important to note that um, well, four was, uh, was used to discharge or water was taken from that well to discharge into the Crow River uh, under a DNR permit at a rate of 5.2 million gallons per year. Um, and the MPCA identified additional sites uh, for excavation to try to eliminate this over the years. And there were increasing levels of contaminants identified in other wells. Uh, citing the cost in 2012, MPCA abandoned the plan to excavate the site, which was, uh, you know, hopefully would, would have been a, a better remedy at the time. Uh, and they continued to pump city wall number four uh, to try to mitigate that contamination spreading effort. Um, there were mounting wells installed around town. And uh, in uh, 2015, uh, evidence was pointing towards a uh, drinking water occupier, or there was one drinking water occupier between the underneath the city of Painesville. Um, and it was only a matter of time before the contamination reach, reached the other wells. So based on that, the city in 2015 was requesting a $2.5 million grant to upgrade the water treatment plant and install a, a volatile organic compound plant, a VOC plant, to help ensure that the water in the city of Painesville was, was safe for use. So in 2016, the city of Painesville received a grant for 1.83 million to install this plant. It covered the entire cost. However, it did not cover the maintenance costs. Uh, and uh, in 2021, uh, the city uh, had to replace the VOC filtration membrane at a cost of approximately $170,000. These membranes were supposed to last 20 years. However, because of the contamination of the, the content of VOC, it only lasted a six or seven, or, you know, seven to eight years instead. Uh, so there's going to be an ongoing maintenance cost as a result of this. Uh, as you can see here, this is the water treatment facility in Painesville. On the right, that is the VOC plant. Uh, that was put in in uh, 2016. Uh, this is a map from the MPCA showing where the contamination is. Um, and of course, the main facility was right here, the um, uh, station that um, the uh, tanks were leaking from, and it spread to other parts of the city. The main wells of the city at the time were right around here. Uh, and of course, subsequently, there were mounting wells installed around town to monitor this on an ongoing basis, which is still going on today, by the way. Uh, these are This is the main site of the service station. As you can see, monitoring wells were installed uh, you know, to monitor on a regular basis. This is in a residential area. And all over town, you can see monitoring wells um, at different locations throughout town. This is one of the neural wells that was had, had to be uh, put in. Uh, so far, this, this well, there is no contamination. It's, it is a very uh, um, successful or um, um, good well for the city. Uh, more monitoring wells around town. And last photo here was the main well at the time that had to be shut down because it was contaminated. Uh, this is a report from Terracon, the uh, uh, company that does the annual monitoring for MPCA. And it just shows you how the plume has spread over the years. Uh, and you know, efforts to contain it uh, were not successful at that time. And that's all I have for you right now. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that. I do have one question when you go back to your presentation. Yes. I underlined the word uh, volatile organic compounds. Uh, can you tell me what that is or, or should I ask the MPCA when they get up here? I, I'm not sure. What uh, I prefer you ask them because I am not a, uh, water contamination expert um yeah okay that's fine members any questions of the testifier seeing none thank you very much thank you next up to testify would be uh assistant commissioner for land policy kirk kodelka and remediation division director jamie wallerstadt Commissioner, welcome to the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and committee members. Uh, for the record, my name is Kirk Adelka. I'm an assistant commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. 
and I work on land issues, including our remediation programs. Uh, we also, as you mentioned, have our remediation director available if there are questions to, to get into more details. But I'll, I just have a, a few uh, quick thoughts. I wanna thank the committee for the time and, and the author for meeting with us yesterday on this bill. I uh, wanna share a few thoughts and, and, um, and information. Wanna just highlight the four communities that are mentioned in the bill, the Painesville, Blaine, Foley, and Alexandria. Um, we have want to make sure folks understand that there is safe drinking water for all these communities. It has been sampled and it meets the Department of Health's health-based values for uh, petroleum products. So these are wells that have been monitored and want to make sure that it's clear that folks are drinking safe water because that is our mission at the MPCA and, and the community's missions, um, you know, provide safe drinking water to its residents. Uh, specifically for Painesville, MPCA and the Department of Health have been sampling the current city wells since 2002 and has shown no detection of contamination from petroleum products in those wells. As mentioned, we have barrier, um, we have wells in between the contamination and those city wells and have not seen contamination and has no data to show that the plume is moving at this point. A Blaine did have contamination in the well in 1999 uh, that was over the health-based value set by the the Department of Health, and uh, immediately this agencies work to provide treatment and install it on their system so that they are providing safe drinking water to those residents. In Foley, this is not an issue with a municipal water, but a uh, private wells. And this is a situation where we did work and find that there were four private wells impacted by a petroleum leak. Uh, three of the wells have been replaced or treatment provided to them to continue to ensure that safe drinking water is there. In Alexandria, um, we do have safe drinking water, again, going to the residents. It's monitored by MPCA and the Department of Health. Uh, there are some petroleum products found at very low amounts in two of the wells that we are continuing to, to work on with, the, with our agencies. As noted in the testimony earlier, there's a lot of work that goes into all of our sites, and uh, we take this very seriously, and there are investigations and actions to address these sites that are occurring or uh, have occurred. Uh, some of these sites uh, still have active investigations going on. So we do have some questions about whether this is duplicative of work already being done. We as an agency prioritize work based on a number of risk factors. And this legislation uh, creates and places other projects in front of those and sends resources to that area. Resources that we think may be better spent on communities that have exceedances of health-based values or other projects such as the look back program where we are looking back at gas uh, additives and um, with additional new science and understanding to go back to that decisions that were made decades ago to make sure that we're still providing safe drinking water to these communities. We think that we can accomplish a lot of what uh, the goals of this bill is through additional conversations with the community about our work. We're always more than happy to meet with communities, whether it's these four communities or others, to answer any questions they may have about investigations undertaken in their area or potential actions taken. And we believe that could answer a lot of the questions that have been raised by this legislation without the additional expense. We also have questions on whether it's the intent of the legislature that create a precedent where providing um, this type of additional consultant review for other parties that request them because difference of opinion with MPCA's decisions, whether it's with uh, the petroleum remediation sites, all contaminated sites or controversial projects that may include air or water permits. We are, um, you know, we are a little concerned about will this pull additional dollars away from addressing and investigating sites that where we have known contamination and exceedances. So those are some of the thoughts. Uh, we do appreciate the, the comments and, and the author's comments as we will work with them to find a, a number to help get an estimate of what the number would be for the bill, a cost estimate. And so we do appreciate those ongoing conversations. And thank you, Chair and, and committee members for the time. Mr. Kodelka, please talk to me a little bit about the Alexandria one. I'm somewhat familiar. I think it is from a spill from many years ago. Is that correct? Can you tell me when that happened and, and uh, how many approximate wells that you've drilled over the years to check on the aquifer contamination? Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, there is a number of, of pieces, and so I'll go on a high level, but you're right. There are a number of petroleum leaks from various sites whether those are gas stations or um, we have you know 10 sites currently open 
or the Magellan Terminal, which has impacted private wells in the city. And so we have worked in that case to be able to provide safe drinking water to those residents through extensive monitoring. Um, but there are a number of sites that are under investigation and sites that we've already taken action, whether it's removing contamination or other types of efforts to continue to move forward. Uh, we'd be more than happy to talk more in depth. There are just given the sheer number of sites uh, at a future date to, to go into more detail. I uh, happen to have a, a very experienced well driller that has contacted me several times over the past three, four years, uh, at least with regards to that one. I know the one in Painesville has certainly been around for a while. We've been talking about that one fully, not quite so familiar with that. Um, but he, he claims that, that that plume is still moving towards the city wells in Alexandria and, and is very concerned about it. And um, I don't know if you've been talking to the city of Alexandria or been talking to uh, anybody there lately about that. Has there been any discussions uh, more recently or is it something that you're willing to have again? Mr. Chair and committee members, we're more than happy to have conversations. We are MPCA and the Department of Health are having conversations with the cities on some other issues right now that we're looking to address. So we'd be happy to talk about the petroleum sites in addition to those conversations. Okay. Members, any, uh, any questions? Senator. Thank you, Mr. Senator Chair. And, and I, I don't wanna uh, uh, continue to, to uh, question how much time you've had to read the OLA report that just came out last month on uh, petroleum remediation program. But I just pulled out a couple of high points of that summary. For one thing, I, I was surprised to find out that the MPCA does not directly investigate petroleum releases or cleanup. They actually uh, hire environmental consultants that are usually hired by the people that are responsible for the leak or the contamination to perform those cleanup activities. And now in order to be considered an environmental consultant, you have to, rest, you have to register with the Petro Fund, the Petro Board. And so in order those, for those consultants to meet the requirements to be considered an environmental consultant, here are the four items that they have to meet. One, they have to have uh, liability coverage. So they have to have a bond. They have to agree to abide by the laws. They have to uh, be available. Their records have to be available for inspection. And number four, they have to sign a statement saying that each claim they submit for payment is accurate. Uh, pretty low standard. Uh, so I think any one of us could go out and become an environmental consultant and do the cleanup of these, these positions, these uh, situations. Uh, and so nowhere in here does the Petro Fund Board look at the qualifications, the technical qualifications of these people that are out there doing these uh, cleanup? Uh, and according to state law, these consultants determine or with the MPCA to determine if this is a low potential risk or a high potential risk. Now, if it's a low potential risk, it's by state law that they're supposed to use the passive bioremediation program where the organisms in the, in the earth eat the contamination, which I know happens as a, as a fire marshal and a fire investigator. I took many samples and forgot to freeze them and the bioorganism in the earth ate my, my contamination so I couldn't prove arson. So I learned that the hard way. But, you know, the idea here is we are basing that these risks are been nullified or taken care of by a third party that is getting paid either by the people that contaminated the space or by the folks that have a direct relationship with the state of Minnesota and the MPCA. I believe that it, what I'm concerned about is that if uh, these issues have been raised, 
Many of these citizens in these communities are concerned about their drinking water. I think that spending a little bit of money to have an independent consultant to go out and take a look at these sites to ensure that they're not contaminated and that the process is actually working to clean it up is a small amount to, make, to pay. I really don't want to be gone from here 10 years from now and not end up with a big problem and find out that we have a bunch of increased leukemia cases because benzene is directly tied to leukemia. And I don't think anyone has been taking a look at and seeing if we have increase of that, those cancers in these sites. So I'll, I'll rest for, for questions. Senator Howell, I, I do see the, you don't have any, any cost in, on the, in the bill here. Do you have any idea what that would be? Or is this something you're still working on? I'm or? still working on that. We've been okay. in contact with a couple of consultants. They're working on to figure out exactly what those costs will be. And I'll be continuing to work with the MPCA sure. to figure out exactly what that would cost to have one consultant coordinate with the four cities and do a, a, a study or a review of the processes. Very good. Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I would like to ask if, um, you know, it, it seems that this is a, a situation where um, we do not uh, see uh, from from records uh, that that we are in need of this, uh, but we need to figure out uh, ultimately, like uh, Senator Howe is is proposing here, whether or not this is happening. And uh, according to the agency, we have other sites that we are actually not investigating because we don't have the funding to do this. And I would like to ask um, the chair if we have. Uh, uh, plan to uh, review some of the findings from the OLA report because I think they are connected and we can connect this report to uh, you know some of the issues that we're talking about in this bill. Thank you, uh, uh, Senator. Do you have any comments about that? Uh, well, I, I you know this this thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Torres Ray. This this report just came out in February. Uh, and it's just timely that this, this hearing came up. And I think there are a number of things that we have to look at, especially with the way it's currently set up that we need to address when it comes to petroleum uh, remediation and, and the current program. Because I believe that this OLA report raises a number of questions of whether we're doing due diligence. So thank you, uh, Senator. And, and Senator Torres Ray, just know that I did actually review the, uh, the OLA uh, uh, with with the uh, um, the auditor and and uh, have a pretty good grasp on what uh, what their findings have been, but I think this is something that we have to move forward to. Is that uh, if you're asking me if I have the money or it's been budgeted? Of course, I don't have a target, um, but it's something worth uh, certainly looking at. And I think a consultation between the uh, the city leaders of the uh, three towns that are that are on the bill here should should continue so we can come up with uh, with an idea and I think at the same time I you know I think the MPCA should be involved in those discussions as well and uh, uh, but I think uh, that's you know again uh, that's something that can can happen here in a in the real quick future I guess uh, um, but uh, yeah I would like to see I would like to see something uh, at least looked at and decided here and and uh, um, so have you got any further questions at all? Senator Eaton, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you, welcome back to you. Yeah. Um, my question, I'm a little confused. Is I don't understand if there's actual um, uh, contamination uh, right now verified. And I don't know why we're uh, focusing on these few cities instead of all 145 that were listed in the original lawsuit. Um, and why is Painesville uh, in charge of the remediation for all four cities? And I mean, I just, it's a confusing bill to me. Senator. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Senator Chair and uh, Senator Eden. The, the reason that Painesville is, is they, they were, of course, they happened to be in my 
my district and I'm more familiar with them and they agreed to be the coordinating piece with all four cities to make it happen. Uh, they, they volunteered, they, they are probably more concerned than, than the other three, but, uh, and they volunteered to do the work to, uh, to actually coordinate with the other three cities and to, to direct that, that's, that's the reason. If, I suppose if I would have been in, in the, if Foley would have been in my district or Alexandria would have been in my district, I could have picked any one of those, but I actually had meetings with Painesville. They are very concerned. Uh, and so when we thought about doing the, the four cities, uh, they were more than anxious to try and, and, and push this thing along. So that's, that's the reason, and they're not in charge of the remediation. They're just gonna hire the consultant to, and funnel the money through the, to the consultant to do the study of the four cities. So they're not, I wouldn't say they're in charge. I think they're just gonna be in charge of the purse. Senator Eaton Paul. Okay. Members, any other questions? I think uh, if there's none, I, I, I certainly would like to encourage everybody to look at the OLA report. I mean, everybody gets a copy of that. And uh, a lot of times it gets a little, uh, a little in an area where you probably don't understand, uh, but you get to the recommendation part and, and the findings and, and uh, it's pretty clear that uh, if there's any questions at all, uh, they usually do a tremendous job of coming up with uh, ways to resolve issues and, and uh, review issues that uh, may have not been done properly. So uh, again, a work in progress. Uh, any further questions, members? Seeing none, thank you, Senator Al. We'll be laid over. Thank you, uh, yep. Chair and members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Next up on the agenda, and maybe Mr. Kadelka, before you, if you're going to be around before the end of the meeting or till the end of the meeting, I can talk to you about the volatile organic compounds. So just offline is fine, just so I know what that that means. Uh, next up is the. Uh, Senate file 2768, Senator Rood. We're gonna talk about salt applicator program establishment. We certainly needed a lot of that here this uh, last few months. And our cars show that actually, <laughs> so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Thank Senator you, Mr. Rood. Chair, um, Senator Rood. Um, this is Senate file 2768, I think you're, um, a lot of you are familiar with this. This is a bill that we've been working on for um, a few years now, and we've been um, really trying to get it over the finish line right now. Um, a lot of the committee members here have worked very hard on it, and I know Senator Eaton, you have over the years. You know, Minnesota has uh, currently 50 chloride impaired lakes, and an additional 75 uh, are on the cusp. Just one small amount of de-icer, a, a tablespoon or a teaspoon, um, permanently um, pollutes five gallons of water and the, and the, and the de-icer cannot be removed. And you see um, all over um, the roads, the salt, and in our apartment buildings, the salt. And what we're attempting to do is really educate people. And I think in the last couple of years, even though we have not passed uh, the, the bill about the liability, um, we've seen a great effort to educate people. I myself in Brainerd took the, um, uh, the snowplow de-icer class, um, although I tell folks they didn't let me drive, um, but it was very, very interesting. Our snowplows are incredibly um, high tech with temperature gauges and um, they can tell exactly when they should put that um, de-icer on the roads. And with the education, um, I, our counties in greater Minnesota have seen a great reduction in cost because they have used so much less. Um, I hate to say that that's one of the driving issues to get this done, but it really is. Um, it, it is so much more cost effective to do use the salt when and at timing and it, that it needs to be put down. So with that, what we're trying to do is put together um, education 
um, it's voluntary certification um, for our SALT application applicators. And I have um, two folks with me that have worked on this very diligently. Um, I have um, Ms. Fortin and Ms. Nissen, if you'd like to come forward. Oh, Connie's virtual, sorry. Good morning. I'm sorry, I didn't have my mic on. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself. My name is Sue Nissen. I'm a Minnesota water steward and a citizen volunteer with Stop Over Salting. Uh, Senator Rood, thank you so much for, again, championing this bill. It is really important to Minnesota. And um, we think at Stop Over Salting, we're a citizen group, and we think this bill is good for clean water. It's good for infrastructure. It's good for our commercial salt applicators and for maintaining public safety with a lot less salt. And we can do this. This spoon that we're both wearing demonstrates the pollution power of a small amount of de-icer. And as Senator Rood said, it just takes one teaspoon to pollute this amount of water um, to the EPA standard for toxicity for aquatic life. And removal is expensive and impractical. So it's becoming a permanent part of our waters and the result is our fresh waters are just plain saltier and saltier. And we don't see that because dissolved in water, it's clear, the water's clear. So we don't see the salt, but the data is in. And as Senator Rood said, we've got 50 water bodies impaired. We've got 75 more at the tipping point. We've got uh, upward salt trends in our drinking water monitoring wells and in our groundwater. And in Minnesota, we use about 400,000 tons a year and that is a lot of teaspoons of salt and it's not all needed. So um, stop over salting volunteers. What we do is we spend a lot of time in our communities and we frequently talk with commercial applicators and the property managers. Many are not trained, we know that, in their best practices. And overwhelmingly, there is this pressure um, to oversalt because of the belief that visible salt on a property um, provides protection for slip and fall lawsuits. The combination of those two is driving over application. And we also find that most applicators are acutely aware of the destructive side effects of the de-icers. And they tell stories about how much they love their lakes they love to fish. Their frustration over infrastructure damage really gets them going and replacing dead landscaping every year also really gets them going. However, at the end of the day, applicators need to protect their small businesses and currently over applying the ICERS does just that. So the opportunity for the liability protection is an incentive for the commercial applicators to enroll in MPCA's highly effective smart salting training, which Senator Rood's taken, SOSers have taken. It's a virtual program. It teaches science-based best practice. And when we attend those trainings, we see applicators return to their companies, companies with a lot of enthusiasm um, because they've learned so many ways that they can reduce de-icer use yet maintain public safety. They report 40 to 60% reductions after training. So we have a vision for Minnesota that every teaspoon of de-icer counts in a positive way. And this bill is a real and necessary step in that direction. And thank you so much. Please support seven, uh, Senate file 2768. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. And yes, you're right. It is one of those um, disappearing things. One of the things that are in the water that we don't know about. Um, easy to overlook, kind of like the garbage cans at the end of the driveway, the garbage just goes away. And that's the end of it. And that's not necessarily how it works. So um, I see we have a fee here and, and a liability, Senator. Um, I believe the uh, committee, we're gonna wanna send this off, off to the Civil Law Committee. Uh, Mr. Had, Chair, yes, um, yeah. there is a fiscal note. We have, um, the MPC has done the training um, in, by grants so far, yeah. and the grants will be ending, and so they will need funding for the for the training program. Sure. And this does, because of the liability section, need to go to civil law. Okay. Any questions, Senator Eaton? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to thank um, Senator Rood for her perseverance in getting this bill moving forward. It's been a long battle and it's, I think it's crucially important. So thank you. Senator Dibble. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also wanted to express my support for this bill and thanks to Senator Rood for moving it along. Um, I have several constituents who have been leaders on this matter as well. So I appreciate that this bill is back with us and seems to be moving along. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Mr. Thank Chair, you. if I could, um, maybe one of the pages come. We have we have some um, spoons for you today. Oh, okay. Um, Senator icorn has got a question first. <laughs> sure, uh, and census is going to civil law. I'll reserve my comments for later on the uh, liability portion of it. There's definitely some concern there still. Um, my first question would be to Senator Rood, and then I will have one for the PCA. If somebody from the PCA is here, I'm curious about the fee portion. Um, why not government employees? Why just, um, why just the commercial applicators? I've seen situations, and even in MCEA's letter, they do call out large scale roads and roadways as part of the issues as well. So why don't we have government employees do this as well? Okay. Who would like that, to take that? Was for Senator Rood. Oh, um, Senator Rood. Then I've got, I have one for the PCA after that okay. question. Senator Rood. I, I think they have the answer to that question. Okay. Thank you. Welcome Mr. to Chair. the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Tom Johnson, uh, Government Relations Director for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and and thank you, Senator. Um, uh, my understanding is that uh, currently municipal and uh, and other government uh, employees do. Uh, take this training. However, uh, this would purely be an incentive. The liability piece would be an incentive for the commercial applicators. So this program does um, does cover all types of, of salt applicators, both government and otherwise. Uh, and, and there have been trainings in all of those, uh, but they already have legal protection elsewhere in statute. Follow up on that, Follow Mr. Up. Chair. Go ahead. I would I would respectfully disagree that they all get training. I've seen several situations where you can pull up behind somebody in a in a truck that's doing salting, and it's you know they're putting more than a person would ever put on in their own driveway or their own sidewalk, and you can drive up behind some, and it's just a little trickle of salt, and you wonder if it's even close to enough. So, um, I think it would be important if we're going to have this have uh, commercial applicators do this that we consider saying that government employees also have to do this. If it's good for the goose, it should be good for the gander. Uh, on the fee, I see it's up to $350. I, I appreciate that discretion. I see in the fiscal note, um, the assumption is the PCA is going to automatically start at $350 uh, per trainee. Is that the case? Do you plan to start lower than that? Um, where do you see the agency starting there? Is it, is it just gonna be the 350? It Mr. certainly John could be lower. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Icorn, thank you for the question. Um, the, we, our understanding is that the, in, in the bill, um, this would be a flat $350. Uh, so that would be where, where we would set it. Um, that um, is close to uh, or around our costs for, for this program. Uh, we would prefer to have, have more of a, uh, a discretion uh, for for whatever uh, fee would cover the costs fully, but um, but three hundred and fifty dollars is is workable for for the agency. Follow up on that, and then a question, up. Mr. Chair. That, that's unfortunate to hear. You're going to start at three hundred fifty. I think there's a lot of small businesses that you know, John Smith with ABC snow plowing might do some salting, and if he wants to do this, you might be pricing some people out of the market, which I think is unfortunate. I hope there's a mechanism that the agency can find to help some of those folks that might be small business take the program. I do appreciate that Senator Root has this as a voluntary program. Uh, my question for the agency would be, is there anything in current law um, where you could see the agency go through rulemaking, making this a mandatory thing? I have no issues as long as this continues to be voluntary, but we've seen too many times where the agency uh, takes over the place of what the legislature should do and move forward with something. I just want to make sure that it is not the intent and you don't have the authority to turn this into a mandatory program after the fact. Mr. Johnson, and also the question I would have is how many trainings have you as an MPCA participated in so far? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, to, to address Senator Eichhorn's uh, question first, um, I am not sure on, on our authority in that regard. I will have to get back to you on that. However, it is not our intent to make this a mandatory program. Uh, it has been a very popular program and we are happy with its, uh, uh, with its outcomes as a voluntary program so far. And, and, and to that point, uh, Mr. Chair, I believe there's been over 2,000 uh, folks certified since 2020 when the program was officially uh, established um, and, and more before that, I, I believe, uh, but I'll have to get back with any specific numbers. Sure. Follow up and last question, Mr. Sure. Chair. Go ahead. Um, so, so I appreciate that. I did want to get on the record that you don't plan to turn it into a mandatory thing. If you do, I would expect that you would come before the legislature to do that instead of doing it through a rulemaking process. Um, the last one's a hypothetical, just because I do have some concern about the liability piece. I know that'll be hashed out in civil law. Um, but I'm just curious to know, for say for example, somebody gets their gets their uh, salt applicator license or certification and then it gets revoked. Um, what about the property owner that in good faith thought this person they hired was certified and then mid season, maybe they got their certification revoked. Does that property owner with the understanding that they thought they hired this person that was covered, do they still have protection? And I realize that's <laughs> maybe better for the civil law committee, but that's, I won't go any farther down the rabbit hole of liability, but that is an area of concern I do have that if you can address here, I would like to know since I don't sit on civil law. I think if you can uh, go ahead and address it, but it is a question for civil law. I think if, if need be, uh, if you can't, that's fine. I think we, you know, we can actually get to that question in civil law. There is. Sorry, Mr. Chair, was, was this question for, for the agency? Whoever wants to, if the agency can answer it or Senator Rood, whoever's, whoever wants to take it. Senator uh, Rood. I, I don't think we have any mechanism to revoke somebody's certification. I don't, I don't, I don't. You know, I, I think that's just a civil law, and, and that's where that question belongs. Sure. There, it appears there was a, a method to revoke somebody's license or their applicator deal if they weren't following best practices. It looked, I gotta find it, the bill here. It appeared that the Pollution Control Agency could, uh, as a penalty, may re, on uh, 3.11, commissioner may revoke or decline a new or renew a certification of a certified commercial applicator if the applicator violates. Uh, the section or rules adopted under the section. So I'm less concerned about if the person, the person that gets it taken away, then you know what happens to the person who in good faith thought, thought they had that. And if, if, you're, if you're willing to follow up with me on that later, after you've had discussion with civil law, I'm fine with that, but I do have a curiosity there. Very good. Just because as a property owner, I do, I do hire people to, to plow and shovel, and this sure. is something I would be interested in, and I'd want to make sure I was protected if I hired one of those folks. Exactly. I think that'll be answered in that next committee. There's no question. Uh, certainly good concerns. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I don't know if there's any further testimony at all. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I too have um, uh, great support for this bill. Uh, Senator Ruth, thank you so much for your efforts. I think the education campaign that you have engaged in, uh, all, of, all of us in has been very, very successful. I have seen it you know, in my own neighborhood and traveling around that people are really understanding the importance of, of uh, you know, controlling the amount of salt that we put in the roads and sidewalks and everything. So you have my full support. I am wondering if, um, I, I guess it's a question, it's a technical question, is, is this bill moving by itself or is it going to be uh, moving for possible inclusion? I would like to see it moving by itself just because it has tremendous support, I think, around the state of Minnesota and it would be a very good message from the Environment Committee. Uh, Senator, uh, um, it, it has to move from here to the civil law and Senator Rood, I don't know if you have any questions about that, whether it should go forward by itself. I certainly don't have a problem with that. It, it would be nice to go by, it, by itself. I, th I think, you know, we have to get to the civil law uh, committee first to see how, see how we end up there. That answer your question? Senator uh, Torres yes. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Senator Rood, for considering to move the bill by itself. Um, I, it will be great to vote for it. Thank you. And we do have Connie Fort. 
410. Would like um, to testify. I believe yes. she was on the list, wasn't she? Yes. I apologize for missing. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, Chair and Senators. Uh, my name is Connie Fortin. I'm a senior project manager for Bolton and Mink. I've spent 25 years working on chloride reduction strategies. I've developed and taught the MPCA Smart Salty and Certification courses, and I've written all the manuals that accompany those classes. I've been in front of about 20,000 winter maintenance professionals talking about the huge chloride problem Minnesota faces and explaining ways to integrate science into winter maintenance so we can reduce salt. I'm, as, I'm viewed as a leader in chloride reform across America. MPCA is also viewed as a leader in chloride reform across America with their smart salting training program. We are highly respected across the nation. We are number one at addressing this issue and putting together a plan uh, to educate that industry and move forward together. It's time for our elected officials to help us with the private side of winter maintenance, reduce their salt use. The training program, funding for it, the liability legislation, it's greatly needed. Minnesota is the most progressive state um, in understanding the chloride problem. Last year, the MPCA released a statewide chloride management plan. In this plan, it asks every single person in Minnesota to use less salt. We're the first state in the nation to do this and all the cold weather states are watching us. Minnesota has reduced our salt use. And I do agree with the comment that more training across the board is needed, but we're making progress. And some good news from the United States Geological Survey is that in the years from 1990 to 2010, when they looked at the groundwater in Minnesota, um, our rate of chloride contamination was really high. And that huge elevation went all the way from Minnesota off to the east coast of the US. When they continued their monitoring in 2010 to 2020, Minnesota's rate of groundwater contamination had flattened out. And I think it's largely because of the training program. Now, Heinz Steffen and his colleagues at the St. Anthony Falls Labs studied who's using the salt. And they looked in our seven most populated counties. And here in the metro area, it's a pretty even distribution of salt use between MnDOT, the cities, the counties, and the private sector. So we could roughly say the private sector are putting down about 25% of the salt that we're getting in our water. Okay, we've had a lot more success working with cities, counties, and in the state to reduce their salt use. They, they're, uh, they're easier to find, they're easier to get to class, they have more funding, and they are doing a better job of it. So we need some sort of um, tool, some help to get the private side into training and an incentive for them to follow best practices. I think it was already mentioned today that if we look by any restaurant, uh, the pharmacy, the grocery store, we will see lots of extra salt probably right out in front of the Senate building. More salt than's needed for safety. And I can tell you that after training people for the last 15 years, they act either out of ignorance or fear. Okay. And our training class can resolve the ignorance. We can give them the tools, but it cannot get rid of the fear of these lawsuits. So I'm really asking you today to help us. I thank you for your good work on this. We are counting on you to protect Minnesota's water and we have 10,000 reasons why we should pass this legislation. But thank you very much and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much for the testimony and your work on this. Members, any, any questions of the testifier or any of the testifiers still there? Is anybody else in the in the uh, in attendance that would like to testify on this bill? Senator Rood. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate your support today and I look forward to having another conversation in civil law. Would you like to move your bill? I would, sir. Senator Rood moves the Senate file 2768 be passed and re-referred to the Senate Civil Law Committee. Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 All the same sign. Passes off to civil law. Thank you, members. Um, I don't think there's anything before the committee at all, uh, so we stand adjourned. Mm -hmm.